So it's now 11.20 over here on the East Coast of the United States. Um, we are going to get started with our second lecture of today, of the, uh, the launching of this year's Monterey Summer Symposium on Russia. And I'd like to take this time to do a quick introduction of uh, Vladimir Vladimirovich Posner. Um, and, though I'm sure all of you are very familiar with his background. So uh, one of the most recognizable political commentators on Russian television, Vladimir Vladimirovich Posner is a veteran journalist and best-selling author. He's unafraid to take on controversial stories of the day. He's named the voice of Moscow by CNN. Posner is a foremost authority on Russian and Western relations with expertise that gives him the unique ability to speak about the most pressing geopolitical issues facing the world today. Not a stranger to the Middlebury Institute of International Studies at Monterey, uh, Vladimir Vladimirovich has spoken to the Institute's graduate students during the semester, but this marks his first keynote address to the summer symposium. We are fortunate enough to have Mr. Posner join us again for the closing lecture during week five of the MSSR. The title of his lecture today is What and Why We Think What We Think of Each Other. Please join me in welcoming Vladimir Posner to MSSR 2020. Loud applause, right? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> well, thank you very much. Um, I'd like to start by saying that I am indeed just a journalist. I'm not involved in political science. I'm not involved in politics. Um, I'm just a journalist and I'm going to be speaking as a journalist. And indeed, this is the first time I've had the, uh, the honor to uh, be, make a keynote address. So I'm about as nervous as a hitter coming up in the bottom of the ninth with two outs and the bases loaded. I mean, I don't know what's going to happen, but I'll do my best. I'd like to start out with something I learned recently. I was participating in a show on Moscow television called The Big Game or The Great Game. Uh, and uh, from, from DC was brought in the um, Russian ambassador to the United States, Mr. Antonov. And he said that he'd recently visited the State Department and had a conversation with a ranking State Department official. And he had asked him, how do you, how do you um, evaluate the present state of relations between Russia and the United States? And the State Department official said in one word, terrible. Um, and I think that's perfectly right. But I would also say that the relationship between Russia or the USSR and the United States over the past many, many decades has been terrible, more or less, with just a couple of exceptions that I'm going to touch on a little bit later. But ever since the Bolsheviks came to power in Russia in 1917, uh, the relationships, the relationship between the two countries um, has not been anywhere close to good. The call for world revolution on the side of the Bolsheviks in Russia and the threat that presented of nationalization of private property really scared the American establishment. I'm not talking about the rest of the world. It could apply to them, but I'm speaking specifically now of America and Russia. And that call to take away the wealth of the richest was taken very seriously. And it led to a backlash in many respects. First of all, I'd like to call your attention to the fact that there were military forces from the United States on the Soviet Union soil between 1918 and 1920. This is something most people don't even know about or what they knew they may have forgotten. But those forces were on, in the Far East, Vladivostok, and in the Northwest, Murmansk and Archangel. There weren't many of them, about 5,000 in one place and 8,000 in the other, but nonetheless, they were there. And they fought against 
what we could call in general, generally speaking, the Reds. Uh, keeping in, keep in mind now that there have never been Russian forces on American soil. So psychologically, there was a beginning there of an attitude that the United States was out to destroy what was going on in Russia and that Russia was being attacked by the United States. These things are not easily forgotten. And it's something that we should keep in mind when we talk even about today's relationship. Then in America, you had the Red Scare. You had the Sacco and Vencetti trials. You had the Palmer raids. Uh, and then later you had such slogans as a red under every bed and better dead than red. And you had McCarthyism. All of those things were a reaction to what was seen as the danger presented by Soviet ideology, Soviet philosophy, call it whatever you want. But it really was pretty scary to the United States. But what about, so there was this picture. In fact, I recall um, a big cartoon that dates back to 1918 in one of the um, more well-known American magazines. On the cover, you have the American flag under which is crawling a guy with a beard and a fur hat on which it says Bolshevik. And in one hand, he's got a smoking bomb. And in the other, he's holding a knife. And that was really the picture that Americans were getting. These are what the Russians are like. Now, the picture that Russians were getting of Americans was very similar, not crawling under the flag, but it was about the blood sucking, uh, greedy uh, capitalist who um, exploited, cruelly exploited the working man, sucking money out of him. Uh, so again, he had this picture of so-called Uncle Sam, but the Russian version of Uncle Sam with a big belly, with his feet on the table, smoking a big cigar. So those pictures, they date from way back and you shouldn't think that they had no effect because they really did. Uh, so on the one hand, you have the Russian who's a kind of a thug, an enemy of freedom and an enemy of America and really no attempt to make a distinction between the Russian government and the Russian person. It's almost like one whole. Now in Russia, there was a slightly, I would say more sophisticated, if I may use that word, approach, but it was based on ideology because the American worker was supposed to be the brother of the Russian worker. The American proletariat was to be the brother, supposed to be the brother of the Russian proletariat. The American farmer was to be, was supposed to be the brother of uh, the Russian, well, later on collective farmer, but before that, just regular farmer. So there was a difference. We are against uh, the American capitalist. Now we are against the people who run the White House and we're mostly against Wall Street depicted as this terrible place and so on. But there was a slight difference which led to the fact that for a long time, Russians were not anti-American per se, and that's to say per American people, but they were very much anti-American in what concerned American policy, American leadership, and so on. Now, uh, as I said, there were two brief exceptions to this state of, I would call enmity, which did exist. And the first was World War II. Now, one of the things that makes me different from, I think, all of you is that I'm much, much older. So I can remember things you have never even seen. And I remember World War II. I was growing up in New York City. And when the Germans attacked Russia, 
the general feeling was six weeks and it's all over. And then when it wasn't over in six weeks, when it turned out the Russians were really fighting back and then actually dealt Germany its first defeat, Nazi Germany, at the gates of Moscow in December of 1941, uh, it was cool to be Russian. Didn't use the word cool back then, but today it was cool to be Russian or to know a Russian. And I was very proud that I had a Russian name, Vladimir, because I was now a Russian. I didn't speak any Russian, mind you. I'd never been to Russia. I was born in Paris and grew up in New York City. I was the all American kid, but now I was proud to be Russian. And not only that, but the feeling of Americans vis-a-vis -vis Russia was a new one. There was a Russian marshal commanding Russian forces, not very good actually, his name was Timoshenko. Well, the joke was he's not Russian, he's Irish. His name is Tim Oshenko. And that was just you know, part of the attitude. And uh, that lasted throughout the war. Um, and in Russia, although I wasn't there, it was still, it was of course Soviet Union, but I know that people very much appreciated Lend-Lease, the fact that they were getting um, food from, Amer from America. They were getting uh, Hershey bars. They were getting Spam. They were getting all kinds of things that they needed, that they missed. And not only that, but they were getting weapons. Many of the planes that the, Ru the Russian pilots flew came from the United States. At least 7% of the Soviet arms were made for, in and came from America. They knew about an organization called Russian War Relief, which was made up of millions of Americans who donated money or sweaters and, and scarves and shoes and all of that to be sent to America. So there was a, for a short time there, there was a very different kind of relationship. However, that really didn't last very long. But, um, it's something that I think is worth remembering. Now, it's important, I think, to, to point out a couple of other things that happened during the war, because strangely enough, the history of World War II, insofar as what the Soviet Union did and what the Allies did, and the Allies basically being the US, the UK, and to a certain extent, France, um, that history has been dramatically changed over this past period. Um, during World War II, everyone knew who the, what the Battle of Stalingrad was. I mean, everyone. In Paris, there is even a, a square called Saint, uh, Stalingrad Square. Most French people don't know why, but that's a different question. So, and most people knew what the Battle of Kursk was. And I venture a guess that if I were to stop 100 Americans anywhere in the United States and ask them, say people of your age, what was the Battle of Kursk? I'd probably get a blank stare from just about 99 at least. Because that's not really taught in school. Although it was one of the most decisive battles in World War II, and not only that, the greatest tank battle in the history of, uh, in our history. As for the Battle of Stalingrad, well, Winston Churchill, who had no great love for the USSR, called it the hinge of fate. And he said that that's where the Red Army ripped the guts out of the Wehrmacht, out of the German army. And there was no doubt in those days that the brunt of the war in Europe was taken by and carried on the shoulders of the Soviet Union. You know, eventually the Soviet Union lost 27 million people in that war. The US lost 450,000. It gives you a, an idea of the kind of, of effort that went into this. And I have a great collection of magazines that were published in the UK for the 20th anniversary of the end of World War II in Europe. And in those magazines, there's no doubt as to the main 
effort and the main thrust of who did what in World War II. And yet today, I've, I've read in American school textbooks that the war was won by the US and the UK. And yeah, the Russia was there, but you know, not so important. And that's the result of politics. It really has nothing to do with reality. And in Russian textbooks, almost nothing is said of Lend-Lease or what America did, or what the participation was. What I'm getting at is gradually is that what we think or what we think we know about each other, is it something that we personally, individually come to? Well, I'm gonna get into that as, as I proceed. Now, just to remind you, the, uh, the so-called Second Front, or what is called in America D-Day, occurred on, in June, this month, June 6, actually, 1944. And by that time, Soviet troops had pushed the Germans back out of the Soviet Union and were now in Poland. So you can see there was less than a year to go before the end of the war in Europe. And basically, it was over. Basically, the Germans were on the run. Now, the fact that the Allies came in at that point certainly helped. But one sometimes must ask themselves, did the Allies come in to destroy Hitler? Or did they also have in mind not to let the Soviets get too far west? It's a question worth asking. I don't have the answer, but I sometimes have some suspicion as to this, what it's, what it's about. When I say all this, I'd just like to kind of make a general statement that in the way we look at each other, what we think about each other, and what we think we know about each other, is the result of our minds having been poisoned on both sides of the fence. We have been taught to see the other side a certain way. We weren't born with this view. We learned it. We learned it. We were taught to look at it this way. Now, to get to the second improvement of relations, well, that was the decade between 1986 and 1996, when um, Gorbachev came to power in the USSR, and then after him, Yeltsin, who basically, basically destroyed the USSR, because it was Yeltsin who did that in December of 1991 by signing an agreement with Ukraine and Belarus that they were out, Russia was out, and basically there was no more Soviet Union. And during that period, when it seemed that Russia was going to become a democratic country, part of the Western world, in a certain sense, the Russians were popular all over again. It was Gorby this and Gorby that, and everything looked so wonderful. Um, obviously, when all that happened, Russia was no longer the power that it had once been when it was the Soviet Union. And the United States had to make certain decisions as to how to treat this country. Um, try to adopt a kind of a Marshall Plan so that um, democracy might evolve in a certain way in a country that never had democracy because it's in, in its entire 1,000 year history, Russia never had any democracy to speak of. So you really had to teach something to a people that didn't know this thing. Not an easy thing to do, but that kind of approach to make sure that democracy advanced in Russia and that the communists didn't come back was a possible one. The other approach was to say, well, you, you threatened us for 40 years, and now you're going to have to pay for it. And that could have been another approach. And um, I would have to say, and the Russians were, the Russian leadership, let me put it that way, was extremely interested in joining the West. Gorbachev wanted to do that. Yeltsin wanted to do that. 
So there was a real up window of opportunity. And um, sadly, in my opinion, anyway, it was missed. And I say 1996 as being the end of that period because that was when Bill Clinton decided to enlarge NATO um, to include countries that were, had been part of the so-called Soviet bloc and um, countries that um, were in Eastern Europe. The Czech Republic, well, Czechoslovakia was still then, I think. Well, no, it was the Czech Republic, um, Hungary, and Poland. I'm not gonna get into the way Russian and Russian leadership looks at NATO. That's a whole different question. And if you're gonna ask me that at some point, I'll get into it, but right now, that's not what I'm aiming for. But I, what, what I'd like to say is it was a signal to the Russian leadership that the attitude uh, of the United States towards Russia was not going to be one of an equal partner or even of a partner. It was going to be one where Russia was going to be subservient, that America was going to call the shots and the Russians no longer being a superpower and having lost the Cold War would simply have to accept that. And I think that became something that even Yeltsin, who was very pro-Western and who considered himself to be a friend of Bill Clinton's, understood that that period was over. And well, those things kind of piled up. You had the bombing of Serbia. You had the exception of Kosovo. And these things kind of piled up in the same direction. And then along came Putin, who was appointed, shall we say, by Yeltsin, certainly not elected in any democratic sense. And uh, the period on, went on for a while like that until 2007, when Putin made his famous Munich speech, basically saying, we're finished, we're not accepting your view, we have our own destiny. I'm not gonna get into that one, but basically it was the rupture, the final one. And we were back to square one in our relationship. I would even say not square one, but minus square one or minus square two, because the relationship was worse than it had been and got worse that at any time during the Cold War. There may be people who don't agree with me, but I think I can prove my point. And what's more, if in Soviet Russia, in the Soviet Union, as I said, there had been a distinction between Wall Street capitalism and the White House supposedly serving Wall Street's interests as it was seen ideologically, but not the American people. That was different. That changed. And it changed because there was no more of that ideology in Russia. Russia is a capitalist country, call it wild capitalism, call it anything you want, but it has no socialist or any communist ideology at all. So it's not a question of, well, these are our brothers and these are not. Now they're all Americans. And the Russians have come to dislike them. If uh, in America you'd call Russians whatever you did, Ruskies or Reds or whatever, now there's a word for Americans, it's called Amerikosi, which is a very unpleasant kind of, hold on one minute, I, um, I'll, I'll get back to you, I can't talk right now, I'll call. Um, um, it's, it, there's really become real anti-Americanism, something that really didn't exist that long ago. So I get back to my main question. Let's try to answer it. Do we independently form our views of another people? Or are those views formed by others? And if you will, injected into our minds or into our mindset? Well, let's not jump to conclusions. Let's take a look at this. 
one cannot form a view of other people without some personal experience. I mean, you can't talk about what it's like to climb Mount Everest if you don't climb it. You have really no idea except maybe someone's told you something, but you personally, you really don't know. And it's kind of the same thing. But even personal experience can be misleading. I have a story I love to tell. Imagine that you are an American man, just to make this one. It doesn't have to be, I'm not being sexist here, but my story is about an American man. Comes to Moscow and lives in a hotel called the National Hotel, which is opposite the Kremlin. And he lives on the fourth floor. And one morning he gets up, dresses, and wants to go down to the second floor for breakfast. He takes the elevator. Comes into the elevator, there's a Russian, a Russian woman in the elevator. This American man smiles and says, good morning. And the Russian woman looks daggers at him and doesn't answer. And he thinks, my God, those Russians, they're so unsmiling. They're probably very unhappy. They're probably very oppressed. And that's why they drink, I guess. And that's why they are so unfriendly. And the Russian woman is thinking, those Americans, they're so insolent. They think all they have to do to get a woman is smile at her. And that's what the Russian woman is thinking. And they're both right. Because the Russian is thinking from her belfry. In Russia, if you don't know a person, when you come into an elevator, you don't smile and say good morning. You may nod and you may not. It's just not done. While in America, of course you do. But the American is looking at it from his belfry. And what he's thinking is, basically, why isn't the Russian like us? And what she's thinking is the same thing, without even saying it. it reminds me of, you know, my fair lady. Why can't a woman be more like a man? Well, we're different but we think in those terms. So if we're gonna understand each other, we have to climb up the other person's belfry and look at it from there. You've gotta make that effort. If you don't, you'll never understand the other person. And I think that's something we, we never do. In fact, we don't make the effort. Now, what does that mean getting up in the other guy's belfry? Well, it means reading the books, reading the history, studying, not easy. Let me get back to what I asked. So, do we independently form our views of other people or not? What are the factors that determine our views? I've already mentioned, you know, visit each other's country. Not necessarily the way to do it, but it can help. But the uh, not like us factor uh, can, in the absence of knowledge, be a really misleading kind of thing. But what about books? Well, let's face it, not that many people read books, right? Especially in America, Russian books. But even if you do read, let's say, Tolstoy or Dostoevsky or Bulgakov, how much does that contribute really to your understanding of who the Russians are? You've got to be pretty sophisticated and pretty profound to draw a picture of what Russians are like from books like that. So what is the other, what are the other factors? Well, movies, I would say to a far greater degree and for obvious reasons, because visual impact, um, emotional impact plays a role. Now, I'm going to ask you a question. How many movies, Russian movies, have not you seen because you're, you know, you're a specialist, you're, you're a special group, but your average American, how many Russian movies has your average American ever watched? In his lifetime, one, two, I doubt that, maybe three, in rare cases, okay. Now, Russians have watched many more American movies than Americans have watched Russian movies. That's true. And that is important. But um, people mainly watch their own movies, okay? Americans watch American movies. 
Russians watch Russian movies. Now, how many American movies can you remember where Russians are portrayed in a favorable, favorable light? Not dissidents, mind you, not people who want to escape from Russia, but just regular Russians. How many movies can you remember? I remember one, The Russians Are Coming, The Russians Are Coming, which dates back to 1966. That's 54 years ago. There may be another one. I didn't see it, but it's possible. All the Russians that I've seen in American movies, and I've seen a few, are usually cold-blooded, KGB, plotting, cruel, dangerous, untrustworthy, all the negative stuff you can possibly think about. And is the vice versa thing true? Is that the way Americans are portrayed in Russian movies? Yes, it is. Exactly the same way. In fact, the Americans in Russian movies about Americans and the Russians in American movies about Russians are very much the same. And they're all bad guys, with very rare exceptions. Does that impact us? Well, we may say it doesn't, but I think it does. Especially people who don't have access to a lot of information, who just go to the movies. And that's it. What about the print medium, you know, newspapers and magazines. Well, Americans pride themselves, and quite rightly so, on having a free press. So now ask yourself, when did you last read anything at all positive about Russia and the Russians? In the free press. Even in the so-called liberal publications, like say, uh, the New York Times, <clears throat> or the Washington Post, or the New Yorker. And I mean nothing sensational, just something like, Moscow's a pretty nice city, or got some pretty great restaurants, you know? Uh-uh, no. And I challenge you, because I've tried, I've looked, I really have. And what about the other way around? How much positive stuff can you read about America in Russian, in the Russian press, which is not such a free press. It's a lot freer <clears throat> than it was during Soviet times. But in my opinion, it's got a long way to go. But positive stuff? No. You can find positive stuff on the internet. That's true. Or when something like um, the Elon Musk um, rocket went up, um, that was shown, and that's a positive thing, definitely. But by and large, all negative. So that's the second factor. And, you know, not that many people read serious newspapers anymore in America or in Russia. And the yellow press, excuse me for using that word, well, the information you get there, I don't even have to comment on that. So what about television? Well. I'm not going to talk about radio, <clears throat> television. Television, at least in Russia, is the main source of information, much less than it used to be because now there's the internet, there are news pla information platforms out there, there's all got, but still television. And working myself in television, I watch it, not that I like to, because I really don't, but hell, it's my profession, so I look. And what I see is disgusting. For instance, showing what's going on in your country, the demonstrations, the protests, what do they show? They show only the violence. People fighting people, fighting policemen, breaking windows, burning cars. They don't show these demonstrations of black people and white people together, marching peacefully. They don't show that. So what's the impression you get? Well, the impression you get is that Afro-Americans are all thugs, that all they care about is, is uh, robbing stores, grabbing money, 
and beating up women and policemen. That's the picture you get. And that's how an impression was created. And of course, the way you see Russia on your television, and you don't see much of it, let's face it, but when you see it, I would bet, you know, um, everything I have against one of your shirt buttons that you don't get to see anything positive. It's very much the same thing. And the picture is formed in our minds. You know, I'm a biologist by training. And the reason I'm a biologist is because when I was 16 years old, I came across a book by um, Ivan, Ivan Pavlov, the great Russian Soviet physiologist who actually um, discovered conditioned reflexes. If you don't remember what that was like, it was they had these the dogs um, and they would ring a bell and give the dog some meat. Ring a bell, give the dog some meat. Ring a bell and the dog begins to salivate. There's no meat, but it's done. The connection is made between the bell and the meat's coming. Now, if you can do that with a dog, what can you do with a human being? You ever thought of that? I have an incredible story. You know, during the Iran-Iraq war many, many years ago, the Iranis would send children, say 12-year-olds, with backpacks, with hand grenades, but holding in one hand a religious symbol that, that they had been conditioned to believe in. This would save them or send them to Allah or whatever. And they would also lead a donkey loaded with ammunition for the troops. And they would have to cross a field that was full of mines. And so off they went. And when a child or a donkey would step on a mine and get blown up, the donkeys would run away, but the children wouldn't. They kept on going. They'd been conditioned. They believed in that symbol. So the bell and the meat in a different way. But that's what we can be conditioned to do. Hitler put it in a very concise form. He said, find the common enemy. If you want to unite the country, find a common enemy. And they did. The common enemy was the Jew. And the German people, much as though the, today they probably wouldn't want to dwell on that issue, although they, I've said, I must say that Germany has been incredibly um, ready and in fact has um, admitted the sins of the past and so on. Um, but they found the enemy and that's how they worked it out. And I'm saying, are we not being conditioned to? find the common enemy. If you look at polls that have been conducted in the United States and in Russia, who is our real enemy? No question, no question what people answer. What country presents the greatest danger to our safety? No question as to what the answer is. I think that's very dangerous. And I think it's something that we should not only think about, but talk about. Um, so, as I would say, I, I put it this way, we've been victimized. We've been victimized by the people who run our countries, United States and Russia. We've been victimized by media, supposedly independent. But if it's so independent, why is it so uniform in certain questions? Why has there been no real questions asked about why this is going on? These are things that, um, that bother me profoundly because as I told you, or as I don't know if I did actually, I grew up in America, but I live um, in Russia. I'm an American citizen, I'm a Russian citizen. And so for me, what's going on is not just something, not just something that I look at from one side, 
It's something that concerns me personally and very profoundly. And it should concern you. It should concern everybody. But since you, as I understand it, are future experts on Russia, and I'm sure that you feel that you think independently, that you cannot be swayed, that you draw your own conclusions, I would ask you to challenge that and to think seriously about why do I think the way I do about Russia and about Russians. And I say the same thing here to, uh, to um, America, uh, to, to Russians about America, exactly the same thing. Give it some thought, give it some thought. It's, it's worthwhile. And getting back to what this ranking State Department official said to Russia's ambassador to the United States when asked about how he felt about the relationship between Russia and the United States, he said, the relationship is terrible. Give that word some thought. When the relationship between two countries is terrible, that can lead to conflict. Um, when I was probably your age, and that was a long time ago, people were very concerned about nuclear weapons, very concerned. People were out in the street, not only in the US, but in Europe, about nuclear weapons, getting rid of them, um, limiting, limiting them, uh, finding agreements to, to do something about nuclear weapons. Now that just isn't the case anymore. It's just as if nuclear weapons didn't exist. I think that we all have a responsibility. I'm gonna end with the following. Um, I have a grandson who was born in Berlin. My daughter, who is Russian, married a German, and she's been living in Berlin now for 25 or 26 years. So my grandson, whose name is Nicholas, was born in Berlin, grew up there. He's now 25. And I remember when he was about, I guess, 10 or 11, and I was visiting him in Berlin, I asked him, I said, what do they tell you in school about Hitler? about what happened back then. And he said, you know, they tell us it wasn't just Hitler and it wasn't just the Nazis. It was the German people because it was the German people who supported Hitler and it was the German people who supported Nazis. And I must tell you, I was shocked. I thought, wow, teaching kids in school that their people were responsible? I mean, that's pretty amazing. And I take my hat off. But the point I'm getting at is we are responsible. You can always say, oh, it's Trump, it's Trump. Well, who the hell elected Trump? Or it's Putin, right, but who's yelling hooray for Putin? So when push comes to shove, the responsibility is our own. And the decisions we make are our own. And I think it's, it's very important to remember that and to always question ourselves. Are we really doing what we should be doing? Basically, that's all I have to say. <laughs>